Should I get started? Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Okay. So uh, welcome everyone uh, to this series, uh, RNA Collaborative series. My name is Wen Wen Fang, and I am an assistant professor at um, RTI, RNA Therapeutics Institute. Sorry, let me start my video. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, um, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you today um, two amazing postdocs at RTI, uh, both from Phil Zaymore's lab, and I say they're amazing uh, because I've been really impressed uh, by the um, sort of interdisciplinary research they do in the lab, integrating biology, biochemistry, and computational uh, modeling. Um, and so our first speaker today is Ilda Gaidnadnov. Ilda came to us from Russia. Um, he did his math, uh, master's degree in biochemistry in Moscow State University and PhD at Russian Academy of Sciences, um, working in Tatiana Achkina's lab. So there he studied the biogenesis of pyRNAs in humans and also DNA methylation of gene and transposon promoters as potential biomarkers for cancer. Now here um, at RTI, he's been combining genetics and biochemistry with high throughput sequencing and computational modeling to investigate how animals use small RNAs to regulate both host genes and transposons. Um, Ilda, I'm excited to uh, hear your talk. And also to the audience, please leave your uh, Q uh, questions in the Q&A session and not the chat. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect, thank you. Okay, my name is Eldar. Um, thank you for joining. And um, I'm a postdoc in Phil Zamer's lab. And let me tell you uh, the tale of the two argonaut families. Um, in all domains of life, argonaut proteins use small nucleic acid as guides to find complementary targets um, and repress them. And in all eukaryotes, um, an, a clade of argonaut proteins called egos um, is guided by 21 to 22 nucleotide RNAs and microRNAs to find and repress complementary host, viral, and transposon mRNAs. And if in plants and fungi, agos suffice to uh, repress transposons, animals in addition to agos to silence transposons also use a separate clade of argonaut proteins called PV. And those are guided by PV interacting RNAs or pyRNAs um, to find complementary transposon transcripts and repress them. So in fact, uh, the majority of animals use PVs, not egos, uh, to uh, keep transposons in check. So the obvious question is, why would animals need a specialized argonaut clade for this uh, purpose? While in plants and fungi, egos suffice to um, uh, counteract the transposon threat. So, and before I propose you the answer, uh, let me briefly introduce you to the terminology in the small RNA field. Um, we number the nucleotides of the guide starting from its five prime end um, and call them G1, G2, G3, and so on until the end. G stands for the guide. And we do the same with the nucleotides of the target opposite of the nucleotides of the guide and call them T1, T2, and so on. And I'm showing here that nucleotides G1 and T1, uh, regardless of their identity, even if they're complementary to each other, are actually never paired. And the reason is because the first nucleotide of the guide is always buried in the argonaut specialized binding pocket. In fact, this is um, how argonauts hold on to their guides. And in all animal egos, um, structural and biochemical studies have shown that um, egoclade uses uh, the nucleotides of the guide from G2 to G8, the so-called canonical seed, to find targets. And egos do so by prearranging most of these nucleotides in an A-helix form, um, thus preparing the entropic cost of the hybridization with the complementary target. All argonauts um, cleave extensively complementary targets between nucleotides T10 and T11. And in animal argonauts, uh, pairing not only to these two, but in fact, from nucleotides 9 to 13 is required for effective slicing. However, if the target is a transposon, in theory, it can mutate and um, to reduce its complementarity, um, to the guide and thus evade silencing. So our data shows that unlike egos, PVs are much better adapted um, to silence the ever mutating transposons. 
And we propose that this, in, in part, has to do with the fact that, unlike egos, PVs for their catalytic activity require a partner protein called GTSF1. And uh, I will go into the details of the model later, uh, but now essentially, thanks to GTSF1, uh, slicing by PVs tolerates mismatches at any position of the guide. We also find that unlike egos that heavily rely on pairing to the full <clears throat> uh, complementary canonical seed, uh, PVs can effectively find targets both with and without the seed pairing. Thus, this flexibility in target finding and slicing makes PV a much better weapon against the transposon threat. So now let me present you the data to support these conclusions. Um, to measure the argonaut affinity, we, uh, for egos and PVs, we use the method recently developed in uh, Seagull and uh, Burgess lab and used in Bartel lab to <clears throat> measure the affinity of these to their targets. And here a shout out to a former graduate student in our lab, Amina Arif, whose method I used to purify recombinant PV proteins and program them with specific guides. I also collaborated with Hoel, a postdoc in our lab <clears throat> to produce the RNA binding seq data for PV proteins. And I, to analyze this data, I used um, a pipeline and the biochemical model in the pipeline recently published by another postdoc in our lab, Karina Zhuravleva, who's presenting right after me. Um, so using this approach, when comparing a mouse ego protein ego2 and a mouse PV protein NIV, uh, when only uh, considering the canonical seed match, we found that compared to egos, PVs binding to such short uh, complementarity is about 10 times weaker. Uh, by extending the complementarity beyond the seed, uh, affinity will be stronger and closer to that of egos, uh, suggesting that PV proteins uh, require longer uh, extent of complementarity to bind to targets as efficiently as egos do with a small um, extent of complementarity. Um, this was um, also shown recently in, in, in McRae's lab um, for a sponge PV protein called the FPV. Uh, however, the most surprising was the data uh, that uh, when we looked at the sites that did not contain any canonical seed match. For example, moving this nine nucleotide match away from the five prime end of um, the guide by just one nucleotide and starting it from G3 essentially abolishes effective binding by ego, but maybe still efficiently binds to such site as efficiently as it bound to size starting from G2, that is with the full complementarity to the canonical seed. In fact, MIVI can efficiently bind even to the sites complementary to the guide's central part, unlike EGOS, and less so to the free prime end of the guide. Well, we can conclude that unlike EGOS that depend on the seed pairing to find targets efficiently, uh, PV proteins can effectively find sites both with and without the canonical seed pairing. As for the cleavage data, we used both in vivo and in vitro approaches. In vitro, we used an approach called cleave and seek that we recently co-developed with the Greenleaf lab in which an argonaut protein is incubated with a library of RNA targets uh, and each RNA target uh, has different pattern of pairing to the guide of the argonaut protein. And it also contains uh, fixed flanking sequences corresponding to adapters um, allowing subsequent RT and PCR. And to prevent interaction of the argonaut with these flanking sequences, uh, we block them by annealing DNA oligos to these. And if a cleavage occurs, then the PCR is evidently not possible and the target will be depleted from the uh, resulting sequencing library. So sequencing of um, a library of thousands of targets having incubated it with the argonaut for different amount of time then allows us to and directly measure the cleavage rates for all those targets simultaneously. And in vivo, we took advantage um, of the fact that PV slicing generates a free prime cleavage product that contains a monophosphate that is five prime end, allowing us to specifically clone and sequence these. But to distinguish these free prime cleavage products from um, uh, other RNAs in the cells that contain a five prime monophosphate, um, we relied on the fact that we should only expect to detect these free prime cleavage products in those um, mice that contain the pyranase that generated them. So that's why Katie, um, I collaborated with Katie, uh, who used mutants in, originally uh, created by a former postdoc in our lab, Shen, our, an assistant professor at the University of Geneva. Um, and Katie created this triple mutant mouse 
that Lex Parney is coming from three major loci and chromosomes two, nine, and 17. So that is, we expect to detect three prime cleavage generated by these pyranase only in wild type mice, but not in the triple mutants. Um, in the introduction, I briefly mentioned that animal ego 2 for effective slicing requires uh, pairing between nucleotides 9 and 13, uh, which was also recently shown in, in McRae's lab in a preprint of a catalytically competent uh, structure of a plant ego. And um, specifically, if we take, I'm sorry, if we take the in vitro data, Cleveland Sig data, and compare uh, how much slower um, the cleavage rate is for a mismatch ta target compared to a perfectly paired target with one meaning known change, you can readily appreciate that a mononucleotide mismatch between positions nine and 13 has the biggest impact on the cleavage rate with most of them decreasing the rate by more than 10 times. Uh, this really contrasted with the data for mouse PV proteins Neely and MIVI, for which we did not detect a specific region that was uh, with uh, mismatches where the uh, cleavage was disrupted. I'm showing you the data for the exactly same extent of complementarity for EGO2 and MILI and MIVI. However, we do know that pyranase are longer than a cyranase. In fact, five to 10 nucleotides longer than a cyranase. And although it's known that pairing to these extra five to 10 nucleotides at the free prime end of the guide is not required for efficient slicing, our data suggests that Complementarity here, in fact, can compensate for the mismatches at guides five prime end of the central part. For example, if you compare the data for uh, MILI and MIVI, uh, one extent uh, of complementarity stops at G21, shown here in a thin line. And again, the same data, but when the extent of complementarity stops at G25 with four additional paired nucleotides, you can see that the impact of um, pairing uh, of these additional phonoclides at the pre prime end, the impact of uh, monoclonal mismatches is much lower at most positions. Um, and this is even more evident uh, when we look at the dinucleotide mismatch uh, data. Um, for example, in this striking uh, uh, point for uh, mismatches for EGO2 at positions 9 and 10, or 10 and 11, right around the cleavage site for which cleavage was undetectable, uh, yet PVs. Uh, were still slowly but uh, catalyzing cleavage, especially uh, in case when complementarity was uh, longer at the free prime end. So in vivo, in mouse primary monocytes, we found that long extents of complementarity correspond to more efficient cleavage. Uh, for example, if you compare the fraction of cleave site for uh, extent as short as just nine nucleotides, two to 10, and something as long as two to 20, um, and the monotonous increase between those. Um, in fact, we could reliably detect cleavage for sites as short as two to 16. And again, just as I showed you for the, using the in vitro data, introducing a single mononucleotide mismatch um, uh, had more or less, was more or less tolerated um, uh, with the most striking uh, example of positions nine, 10, 11, and 12 flanking the cleavage site. Uh, where pairing apparently is dispensable for PV cleavage. So I have already mentioned that our affinity uh, measurements showed that uh, PV do not, PVs do not rely on the canonical seed pairing and can find effectively targets both with the seed match and without it. And that also was, uh, and the slicing of the such seedless targets was also detectable both in vitro and in vivo. Uh, for example, for this in vitro data for MIVI, when complementarity started at nucleotide G2, um, that is containing the full match to the canonical seed, we detected um, efficient cleavage uh, for longer extents of complementarity, uh, shown here in yellow, uh, orange, and red um, uh, using this color scheme. But the same was true even when the complementarity started at nucleotide G3 or G4 or G5, that is without the full match to the canonical seed. And of course, less so when the complementarity started at the free prime end of the guide. Similarly, in uh, vivo, in mouse primary spermatocytes, we were also able to detect cleavage for both targets with and without the seed pairing. For example, having been the data by pyrene concentration, uh, we, uh, as expected, detected more cleavage uh, for uh, pyrenees whose abundance was high. And the same was true uh, for the targets without the seed. 
In fact, when the concentration, intracellular concentration of a pioneer was at 500 picomolar or higher, uh, the efficiency of cleavage was similar, but both for targets with and without the seed pairing. And I need to note here about the, about, uh, that there are about 1.5 distinct pyrene, uh species, uh, 1.5 thousand distinct pyrene species in mouse primary stomatocytes at this concentration or higher. So having established that neither um, target finding nor slicing requires pairing at specific position, we wonder what are the determinants of PV slicing then? So to answer this question, I used uh, various traditional machine learning algorithms. And since all of them produce similar results, I will only show you the data from the log logistic regression classifier, uh, where I fed um, in vivo data from mouse primary stomatocytes, asking which features were most predictive of efficient slicing. And that would be reflected as a decision function coefficient of each feature with the positive values uh, favoring cleavage. And the most two important features were pyrene concentration, that is how often target is encountered by PV, and uh, the predicted binding energy of pairing, that is how long PV stays on target. Um, as I showed you in vivo uh, data and in vitro, pairing around the cleavage site was not important um, uh, for slicing in vivo. Uh, pairing to the guides 5 prime was somewhat important, uh, likely because it facilitates initial binding to the target. So, but altogether, uh, this data uh, uh, led us to conclude that in vivo, PV proteins um, act as conventional enzymes. Uh, that is, their concentration and affinity for target uh, can predict the efficacy of slicing. So, since PVs are much more flexible in their target binding and slicing, they appear to be better uh, weapon against transposons and are expected, transposons are expected to escape PV silencing more slowly than that of EGOS. In order to measure by how much more slowly, uh, we simulated this process in silico. For that, I took a consensus sequence of a mouse transposon um, L1MD and mutated it by adding one by one a single nucleotide substitutions, thus further diverging it from um, the consensus uh, at each iteration. Um, I also made sure that the ORFs are intact, that is inside the ORFs only synonymous mutations were allowed. And at each iteration of this mutagenesis, at this in silico mutagenesis, I calculated the fraction of the guides, um, that is the cyanase and uh, guiding egos and pyranase guiding PVs, that based on these rules, are still expected to cleave the mutated transposon sequence. And having done that for uh, 26 nucleotide uh, transposon targeting pyranase uh, from mouse fetal testes, and uh, simulated 21 nucleotide cyanase, that I created using just the first 21 nucleotides of the pyranase. Uh, we estimated that um, transposons are expected to escape PV silencing approximately four times more slowly than that of EGOS, uh, suggesting a plausible explanation for why PVs, but not EGOS, were selected in animal evolution as uh, the mainstay of transposon defense. As for the uh, molecular features underlying this flexibility in target uh, uh, finding and slicing, we have a hypothesis about target slicing, uh, specifically why uh, the rules are so relaxed for PV target slicing. Uh, we speculate that um, unlike EGOS, for which perfect complementarity of the target to the guide uh, is likely what brings the target to the catalytic center, uh, for PVs, it is the job of GTSF1, in fact, to bring the catalytic center to the target, thus uh, permitting uh, mismatches anywhere between the guide and the target. And with that, I would like to um, thank you for your attention and, of course, the lab. Um, feel for great mentoring and all the people uh, currently in the lab or previously in the lab whose work contributed to this project. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Okay, I can see one question so far in the Q&A. Um, so please please type your question there if you have any. So from Joanna Vidigal, um, very nice talk. You proposed that PUEs are better adapted to silence transposons because they are less sensitive to mismatches. But since Eagle silence transposons use siRNAs that are derived from the TE sequence itself on siRNAs, always, always fully complementary to the TE sequence they originate from, no matter how many mutations it accumulates. 
In contrast, pi RNAs originate from a locus that is not the same as the TE. And so this targeting mechanism could be sensitive to escaping mutations, perhaps forcing Kiwis to tolerate some mismatches. So could this difference in tolerance to mismatches just be a consequence of difference in the biogenesis of the guides? I like that explanation. It really makes sense. Um, so um, while pyrenees um, acquire their guides, uh, I'm sorry, the PBs acquire their guides, the pyrenees from uh, uh, precursor transcripts that are transcribed from dedicated loci typically, well, we don't really know that yet, really, because there probably are other uh, hypotheses here as well currently. Uh, as cyrenaes are mostly derived from the uh, specific substrate, which is double-stranded RNA. And I agree with uh, John on that. Yeah, that could actually make a lot of sense that the trigger is to um, detect the double-strandedness to produce the cyrenaes and silence transposons. While for pyrenaes, yeah, good point. I like it. Well, well, the evolution already provided the answer, right? It kept PVs, now that goes. <laughs> you think it's in favor of the transposon? Why, why haven't it uh, that is evolved a good point. in favor yeah. of the host? That is a very good point, yeah. So we do know that transposons and their mobilization can be advantages for animals throughout evolution. It has been shown. And um, we really don't understand enough maybe right now about how important versus harmful transposons are mm -hmm. for you know biology and evolution but yes that's a good point i like this conversation yeah catherine yeah. is asking uh, hi katie uh, do you expect these rules to apply to all pv proteins which one was used in these assays you, can you predict some differences between different pvs based on structures right um so we looked at mouse pv proteins mealy and mevi uh, the ones that slice uh, both for binding and uh, slicing. Um, since uh, the GTSF1 requirement for slicing is conserved throughout all animal kingdom, going from spongi to insects to mammals, um, uh, we would predict that, yes, the slicing rules should probably be as relaxed for all um, PVs in all those species and all the others that we don't really study much. But uh, that is a proposition, but as, as we all understand, that has to be tested, of course. Like, for example, one of the, um, well, let's go to the next question. Uh, Nelson Lau, a great talk there. I may have missed this. Did you show the absolute cleavage rate comparison between PV RNA versus Ego RNA? Is MIV as efficient as Ego 2 on a perfect target? What about in flies where PV mutant lacking slicing does not have uh, increased tRNAs. That's a few questions. So as, answering the first one, um, we did compare ego 2 sRNA versus uh, PV uh, pyranase slicing in vitro, and that is similarly fast. It's at somewhere between 5 to 10 uh, per sec, uh, per minute. Um, okay, it would run away. And answering your second question, what about in flies PV mutant lacking slicing does not have increased tERNAs. Flies, if you're talking about specifically the germline, um, have very convoluted ways of silencing uh, uh, transposons, both in which post-transcriptional silencing by slicing and transcriptional silencing by heterochromatization of the loci are feeding into each other. So I would assume that that's what it would be, but that's a good point, yeah. Another question from Peter Wang. Uh, what is the experimental evidence for GTSF1 bringing target RNA to the catalytic site in MIV, thus aiding the slicing? Yeah, as I said, it's speculation currently, but we are working on this and you know, probably someone else as, as well. Charles Bonader. Are purine purine mismatches less tolerated than permitting permitting mismatches? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, if you go into the manuscript, you will find the data there. Yes, we do find that purine purine mismatches because of their bulkier geometry are about five times less tolerated than um, um, other mismatches, all other mismatches, not just permitting and permitting. Um, and GU wobbles are most tolerated among all mismatches. 
but that is all in the manuscript, uh, which is on Barakayev now. Astrid, hi, hi Astrid. Um, is slicing with mismatch at 10 and 11 inhibited in the absence of GTSF1? Hmm. Yeah, we should do that experiment. Can you make, um, the other way around, can you make ego slicing competent with mismatches in the presence of GTSF1? Well, that would probably require someone with a lot of knowledge and expertise in protein design, but you know, everything's possible. Um, thanks for the questions. Um, sure, Gu. Uh, if, you, if you somehow load ego two with the longer guide strand, will it become more tolerant to mismatches? And that's a great idea for an experiment, actually. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Thanks for the great questions. Okay, maybe we should. Okay, maybe just one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, Jona Girgilov, uh, with a higher tolerance of mismatches, could we be more likely to silence endogenous transcripts? Yeah, we also wondered that. And um, we did do, again, an in silico experiment in which if we just take a shortest possible um, um, match extent of complementarity that is required to silence transposons, which is G2 to G16, that is just 15 nucleotides, we find that we can find very, very few transcripts for which a 15 mer would be overlapping with a transposon sequence. So if you just calculate, for example, how many K mers, three mers, four mers, five mers, six mers, seven mers um, that are in the transposon can also be found in an endogenous, an mRNA. And you would expect that this number will be around 100% for the three mer, for the four mer, for the five mer. But then at some point, the longer the K mer you will be uh, sampling, uh, but, you know, trying to see how much is shared between the transposons and endogenous transcripts, the, the lower that fraction of transcripts should be mistargeted. And we found that that drop off, that inflection happens around exactly 15 to 16 nucleotides, which is the minimum requirement for pairing. But that's a good point, thank you. Okay, thank you, Ioda. Maybe we should move on to um, the next speaker, um, Karina Drovaleva. Uh, Karina came to us from France. She had her undergrad, master and PhD degrees at the University of Pierre and Marie Curie in Paris. Um, during her PhD, she studied telomere stability and cancer progression. Now in Phil's lab, she's been studying how microRNAs are made and how uh, also, they guide guide our, uh, uh, agna proteins to control MR, uh, mRNA turnover. I think uh, she's going to talk about the first aspect of uh, microRNAs. Uh, I guess I want to share maybe one behind the scenes story, which I heard uh, to to prepare this um, uh, protein prep for uh, structural determination. She has to <laughs> uh, pure, uh, do the whole purification um, nonstop for forty eight hours. So. Uh, well, I hope you uh, talk about the procedure itself. Well, okay, uh, Karina, it's it. Um, okay, let me show you the. Okay, uh, thank you, Wen Wen, for your introduction, and I, I would like also to thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to present what, my work. Um, work that I will show, uh, work that I will present today was done in collaboration with Tracy and Rob at NIH and with Andre, Dima, and Gabriel here at RTI. And together we used cryo-electron microscopy and biochemistry to study microRNA biogenesis by DICER. MicroRNAs guide argonaut proteins to fully complement uh, to partially complementary binding sites and trigger mRNA destabilization or inhibit uh, translation. And microRNA sequence is uh, essentially determined by two sequential processing steps performed by two endonucleases, first by drosha in nucleus, and then second by dicer in the cytoplasm. And this talk will focus on the conversion of precursor microRNAs into microRNA guide microRNA passenger strand duplexes by dicer. Like all animal RNA processing enzymes, DICER requires a partner protein, which consists of multiple double-stranded RNA binding domains. In Drosophila, it is DICER1 and loquacious, and in humans, it is also DICER1, 
but the difference is that the uh, partner proteins are homologous to loquacious but have different names. MicroRNAs are characterized by four structural hallmarks. They have uh, a tunicleotide three prime overhang, five, five prime phosphorylated end, uh, a double stranded stem region, and a single stranded RNA loop. And structural and biochemical evidence shows that different domains of DICER can recognize all these four structural features. So this provides a uh, high binding affinity to uh, pre-microRNAs. And on this slide, uh, a measure of binding affinity is represented by um, half maximal inhibitory concentration or IC50 values. And here is an example for IC50 value for uh, prelude 7 as an example of uh, uh, pre-microRNAs. And every time you remove one of these structural hallmarks, you can see a decrease in binding affinity. And this is the case for um, synthetic variants, which, uh, which show um, uh, modified uh, termini or have 5 prime OH instead of 5 prime phosphate or RNA loops uh, of different size. And so uh, to date, uh, studies have elucidated um, uh, how DICER contributes to recognition of precursor microRNAs but um, how loquacious contributes uh, to um, uh, pre-microRNA processing is so far unknown. And so together with Dima, a postdoc in Andrei Kerslov lab, we sought to better understand how um, a double-stranded RNA binding domain partner protein assists DICER in pre-microRNA processing. So for this, we performed cryo-election microscopy. And as a model, we used DICER-1 from flies and its partner protein loquacious PB. To improve our chances of getting high resolution structures, we selected a model pre microRNA, which corresponds to prelude 7, but with a fully base paired stem. Inadvertently, unlike prelude 7, model pre microRNA shows uh, a specific order of cleavage, where the five prime strand is cleaved first and the three prime strand is cleaved second. So by using uh, cryoEM, we obtained six high-resolution three-dimensional structures, either in presence of calcium to inhibit cleavage or in presence of magnesium to promote it. And based on the structures, we can now uh, visualize the entire cycle of pre microRNA processing from the initial substrate selection and positioning the RNA in the RNA processing center to sequential hydrolysis of two phosphodiester bonds uh, in the stem region. And finally, the release of the products. And uh, during my talk, I will take you through these main conformational states. Um, so the overall L-shaped um, uh, dicer uh, uh, loquacious complex from uh, Drosophila uh, shows the same topology found in other dicers, underscoring the utility of using uh, Drosophila complex as the model. So DICER-1 has pass and platform domains, uh, a helicase superdomain, uh, which consists of HEL1, HEL2, and HEL2I. RNA3A and RNA3B form an intra-molecular um, uh, dimer. DICER-1 has also domain of unknown function 2A3, as well as uh, C-terminal uh, GSRBD. And like in humans, the third uh, DSRBD of loquacious uh, interacts with um, the helicase superdomain, while DSRBD1 and DSRBD2 of loquacious are not resolved in our RNA free structure, uh, which suggests that they are highly mobile. Um, now let's look closer at APO RNA free uh, DICER1 loquacious complex. And let's steal uh, the RNA from one of our RNA bound structures. Um, so let's try to dock this RNA into the APO complex. And by doing this, uh, you can realize that there are some features which are incompatible with RNA binding. So, first, focus on GSRBG of DICER. And you can see that this domain blocks access to the RNA3A and 3B catalytic sites. And if I try to dock the RNA in the complex, you can see that there are obvious uh, steric clashes. 
Now focus on HEL2 and DAF 283 domains. There is a very little space between these domains, which is insufficient to accommodate single-stranded uh, RNA loop. And when, when we try to dock this RNA uh, in the complex, there is again a uh, steric clash. And now I'm showing you DICER under a different angle, which helps to visualize DICER-specific pass alpha helix, which is also incompatible with RNA binding, as uh, it creates steric clashes with the 5 prime end of pre-microRNA. Now, in the RNA bound structure shown here, these uh, structural features undergo conformational rearrangements. The inserts show superposition of RNA free and are uh, shown in color, and RNA bound structures shown in dark gray. And you can see that upon binding, the di uh, dice specific uh, puzzle for helix rotates away from the RNA. Dicer's GSRBG uh, uh, shifts away from the uh, RNA processing center. And finally, the helix superdomain uh, moves away from the past domain. And so uh, these conformational rearrangements suggest to, to us that Dicer exists in uh, closed and open states. And our 3D classification of the data set did not resolve uh, uh, apodicer in an open state, suggesting that without RNA, uh, the conformational equilibrium favors uh, the closed state. Nevertheless, binding of RNA requires that DICER is in an open state. And so uh, we propose that these conformational rearrangements constitute the base uh, for DICER to authenticate the uh, pre-microRNA substrates. So in our model, uh, pre-microRNAs bind tightly to DICER and um, shift the conformational equi equilibrium towards an open state while other herpins uh, do not bind tightly enough and they are rapidly ejected. So as we reviewed together earlier, uh, pre-microRNAs have four structural features. And to understand how this, uh, how this structure, uh, structural features specifically um, stabilize in open state of DICER, we examined our RNA bound structure. So you can see that the path and platform domains form uh, a protein, ex uh, a positively charged protein extension, uh, as shown here in, in blue. And uh, this extension um, interacts with negatively charged phosphate backbone of the double-stranded um, uh, stem region of pre-microRNA. Uh, LOXPB, uh, GSRBG1 and G uh, GSRBG2 domains, as well as uh, DICERS1, GSRBG, also form a positively charged surface, which interacts with negatively charged uh, phosphate backbone on the side opposite to DICER. And so together, LOXPB and DICER envelope the uh, uh, double-stranded stem of the pre-microRNA and hold it tightly uh, as the buns, or, uh, the buns um, hold the sausage uh, in the hot dog. And moreover, this, um, uh, positioning of LOXPB GSRBG1 is further supported by uh, so far unassigned subdomain of uh, RNA3A, which we uh, call the WIN. So next, DICER also recognizes other structural features. So um, the, uh, the three prime overhang fits in this binding pocket here, where it is stabilized by um, interactions with multiple residues of the past domain. Uh, the five prime end of the pre-microRNA also fits in other binding pocket, which is formed by, by pass and platform domain, where it is also stabilized. And importantly, the five prime uh, phosphate group binds in other small uh, and tiny, uh, tiny pocket where it is stabilized, uh, which explains why uh, DICER has a high affinity for five prime phosphorylated substrates. And finally, the single-stranded RNA loop reposes on the helix superdomain and lies uh, between GSRBG, HEL2, DAF283, and RNA3A domains, which provide uh, stacking and electrostatic interactions. So together, our RNA bound structure, as well as the ability to resolve uh, all uh, three domains of loquacious, enable us for the first time to visualize how a partner protein assists DICER in um, RNA binding. 
And we envision that the same mechanism is used by other dicers and their partner proteins. Interestingly, in plants, uh, dicer-like three protein does not require a partner protein uh, to process uh, isRNAs from long double-stranded RNAs. But you can also notice that GCL3 has an additional GSRBD itself, which uh, mirrors the positioning and the function of GSRBD of loquacious in a Drosophila complex. And this tandem binding of two double-stranded RNA binding domains also mirrors the function of belt and C-terminal GSRBD in Russia, which processes pre-microRNAs from primary transcripts. So now let me show you prelate 7 sequence again, as well as our model uh, pre-microRNA. And in addition, we also designed three more variants with a different sequence around the uh, cleavage sites. All these five substrates showed identical IC50 values, suggesting that uh, they, um, they bind dicer tightly. But, uh, and then we performed a pre steady state kinetic analysis, which allowed us to uh, estimate concentration of the active enzyme. And because we use the same enzyme preparations in all of these reactions, uh, difference, differences in concentration of active enzyme should reflect uh, different amounts uh, of substrate, enzyme substrate complexes in catalytically competent state. And here is the delta G um, uh, of the stability of the stem region. And you can notice that uh, there is a decrease in concentration of active enzyme with increasing, uh, with increasing stem stability. And so this creates a strange uh, paradox. Why these uh, substrates, uh, which, are a great sub uh, which are great binding substrates, are uh, poor catalytic substrates? And our RNA uh, by, uh, bound structure explains why. So here, here, uh, here is the RNA as it appears in the RNA bound complex. And I superposed uh, an ideal a form helix shown here in gray. And uh, you can notice that while the upper parts of both molecules align well, the lower part of pre microRNA shifts away from the a form helix. And this distortion is stabilized by uh, interactions with different residues of loquacious PB uh, GSRBD2 uh, with uh, C terminal GSRBD of Dicer, as well as with Dicer 1 wind, wind domain. And this distortion brings uh, cisyl phosphates into uh, the RNAs 3A and RNAs 3B catalytic sites. So essentially, dicer one loquacious complex requires the substrates to be able to be distorted in order to uh, feed them into the catalytic sites. And so this uh, may, um, may appear counterintuitive until we think about which substrates should not be cleaved in by dicer in vivo. And in flies, the major sources of uh, inappropriate substrates of dicer one come from uh, retrotransposon-based uh, inverted repeat transcripts, self-complementary RNAs, and RNAs coming from bidirectional transcription of bionic clusters. And uh, these RNAs uh, have uh, an increased uh, stem stability, providing uh, a way to dicer to discriminate against the substrates ultimately at catalytic step. So once uh, RNA is positioned properly in the RNA processing center, uh, Dicer uh, hydrolyzes uh, two phosphodiester bonds each on, on each strand. And our maximum, uh, max, uh, maximum likelihood classification uh, identified two structures uh, with hydrolyzed RNA. In the first structure, the three prime strand binds uh, RNA3A uh, site and also coordinates uh, two um, uh, magnesium ions, and a five prime strand is bound uh, um, in the RNA3B uh, catalytic site, but the density of the RNA beyond uh, um, cleavage site is lost, which suggests that this strand has been nicked, and therefore the complex uh, corresponds to a single cleavage event. In the second uh, structure, both strands have been cleaved, 
suggesting that this complex corresponds to double cleavage event. And uh, our maximum likelihood um, classification did not detect a state in which um, five prime strand will be intact and the three prime strand would be cleaved, uh, confirming our uh, uh, biochemical knowledge that the model pre-microRNA fo follows a specific order of cleavage where the five prime strand is cut first. Now, um, let's superpose the uh, double cleavage complex shown in color in, and single cleavage uh, complex shown in gray. And you can see that after the double, um, uh, double cleavage event, the microRNA, microRNA star duplex disengages from RNA's, um, uh, RNA processing center and moves away. And DICE also undergoes conformational rearrangements itself and here, the conform conformational uh, rearrangements are um, visualized by these arrows. The uh, arrow points to the movement uh, of different domains, and the um, size of the arrow corresponds to amplitude of this movement. And so you, you can see that uh, the helicase superdomain uh, moves towards the past domain, uh, suggesting that DICER undergoes a, a partial closure. So based on these uh, structures, we propose a mechanism for accurate and efficient pre-microRNA processing by DICER and a double-stranded RNA binding domain partner protein. Without RNA, DICER predominantly exists in a closed state. And interactions uh, with, uh, with uh, pre-microRNA st um, structural hallmarks specifically um, stabilizes DICER in an open state. Then DICER and loquacious collaborate to uh, position the RNA into, oh, uh, sorry. And so uh, the uh, other hairpins uh, do not bind DICER tightly enough. And so they are ejected um, at this step. Uh, so then DICER and loquacious collaborate to position the RNA in the RNA processing center. And um, hairpins, which cannot be distorted um, uh, and therefore are, no, are not fitted in the uh, RNA processing center, are ejected without being diced. Then the DICER, um, the, the existence of these two checkpoints suggests that DICER may use a conformational proofreading mechanism to authenticate uh, authentic pre microRNAs. Then the DICER hydrolyzes um, two phosphor-D star bonds, each on each strand, but without following a specific uh, order of cleavage. And once uh, both strands are cleaved, uh, DICER um, undergoes a, a partial closure, which may favor the ejection of um, single-stranded RNA product. The double-stranded um, uh, RNA product uh, disengages from the RNA processing center, but remains anchored to our, uh, pass in um, platform domains, uh, suggesting this, uh, this release um, happens last. And the event which triggers uh, this release is uh, so far unknown it, and needs to be uncovered both structurally and biochemically. Now I would like to finish by acknowledging people involved in this work. And I would like first to, th to thank Phil for being an amazing mentor and all Zamer Lab uh, members um, for their continued support. I would like to thank Andre, Dima, Gabriel, and Anna for teaching us uh, CryUM and uh, sharing their expertise in RNA structural biology. And I would like especially thank Dima for his enormous help with data analysis. I also thank uh, Tracy and Rob for providing us cells overexpressing protein components. And I also thank them very much for helping us to look at RNA and protein complexes. I, I thank um, Cryum facility here at UMass Chan Medical School for their help with um, image acquisition. And um, I thank uh, Health Resources in Action who supported me during my postdoc. And the project itself was supported by HHMI and NIH. And I thank you very much for your attention.
Okay, let's wait a little bit for the questions to come in. I think it's a surprising feature that actually higher stable, like more stable hairpins are not clipped very well. Right, but That's something that... I haven't thought about or expected. So if you, so if you, so if you remove the helicase domain, do you think the Dyson would cleave long double strand RNA very well? Yeah, actually this, uh, um, actually this, uh, this version of Dyson does, does exist in vivo and specifically in uh, mouse or oocytes. Uh, so this di uh, the oocyte specific Dyson lacks a uh, HEL1 domain and it is also less specific and can now cleave the double-stranded RNA. But then the second sort of rejection step, which you, you think um, if it's like completely matched, now does it matter still? Because according to your model, you think those wouldn't be cleaved well? Well, if they are fully matched uh, in our model, they are not able to be distorted. Mm -hmm. uh, but once, uh, if you lack the HEL1 domain, like it's the case okay. in, in mouse oocytes, this does not, uh, okay. yeah, those, those, those substrates are clipped as well. And this was also, um, this was also uh, suggested by studies, uh, in vitro studies in humans, where um, deletion of a portion of helicase domain uh, lifted the um, auto inhibition yeah. Um, by hum in human Dyson one. Okay, so maybe you, you want to read the question as yourself. Yeah, let me. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, Charles Poo Nader, congrats, Karina, on these beautiful structures. Is the sequence of the epic, uh, epical loop recognized or only its shape or both? How about the bulged residues? Are they also recognized specifically? Um, uh, yeah, th so thank you, Charles, for your feedback. Um, in our structures, um, we cannot uh, confidently resolve the apical loop, likely because it is uh, more mobile. So um, I cannot, so I cannot comment on whether there are specific uh, contacts, uh, like sequence specific contacts with the loop. Nevertheless, our structure structure suggests that it's rather uh, non-specific uh, stacking and uh, electrostatic interactions. Um, and then your second question, how about the bulged residues? Are they also recognized specifically? Um, so I am not sure about which bulged residues you are talking. We do have, um, uh, we do have one unexpected bulged residue in our structure, which is uh, uh, and, and its bulging out um, event is uh, uh, stabilized by inter interacting with um, dice residues. Nevertheless, um, our model pre microRNA is fully base pair paired. So I cannot tell you uh, with high confidence whether the bulged residues in authentic pre microRNAs are recognized. Uh, I think, though, that those will be. Um, uh, stabilized by loquacious in an A form uh, uh, perfect helix. So, Nelson Law, fantastic talk, Karina. Does your dice structure allow modeling of dice 2? Um, how would a long double stranded RNA helix for making a SRNA dock in your structural model? So actually, uh, DICE2 structure exists already, and this work was done uh, by uh, Brenda Bass. And uh, Brenda Bass lab showed that uh, DICE2 uh, model of binding the RNA uh, and processing it differs from DICE1 uh, pre microRNA processing. Uh, in DICE2, um, the double stranded RNA um, shreds through the helicase domain, which in DICE1 is, uh, is not functional. So I invite you to for more details to, to read your paper. Uh, Shu Gu, a great talk. Does the position, uh, does the position of mismatch on the stem impact just the processing efficiency, effic efficacy or only the overall energy matters? 
Um, so we did not do this experiment. Uh, we we compared substrates with uh, fully base paired stem where we only changed sequence around the cleavage site. Uh, so my guess would be that the uh, is, uh, that it's the overall energy around the cleavage sites would would match the most because that's where you want to uh, distort the RNA in order to fit it in the catalytic sites. Hedy uh, Najafi, do you have any suggested recommended lysis buffer for ego to pull down by IP? Um, well, this is a little bit out of topic. Uh, I do have recommendation of lysis buffer, and you can probably check uh, our recent RNA binding seq um, paper published in Cell Reports Methods, where uh, we provide uh, the detailed protocol for how to purify um, uh, how to purify ego two, um, but I'm not sure whether oh Ildar is typing an answer, so I guess he will reply to this question. And finally, Xavier, uh, nice talk. Rayevsky group showed before on dicer clip data it can bind tRNAs, no RNAs, mRNAs in addition to pre-microRNAs, despite not generating small RNAs. Does the model predict the substrate binding beyond the increased decreased base pairing? Um, so yeah, uh, I guess this would, um, if, uh, if uh, hairpins uh, do display some um, pre-microRNA-like structure, um, Dicer one can can bind uh, them, but if um, they cannot be distorted, um, if it, uh, if they cannot be distorted, they they won't fit in the catalytic sites. So this would correspond to the second checkpoint where uh, those uh, those substrates would be rejected without being diced. Uh, Shogu, if I can follow up with my previous question, will dicer cuts at a single-stranded RNA region if you introduce mismatch around the cleavage site? Um, uh, if we introduce mismatch around the cleavage site, uh, I think, so in our structure, which I didn't, I didn't talk much about, but we, um, we also see um, stacking inter um, we see a non-canonical stacking um, of bases which were not predicted by um, uh, folding algorithms, which suggests that uh, Dyson loquacious uh, collaborate to uh, to provide this pairing. So if you introduce um, uh, mismatches around the cleavage site, the conformation of RNA may be still um, favorable for the um, for the cleavage events. Okay, I guess uh, if there's no more questions, um, I'd like to thank both of you for wonderful talks and also thank the audience for the good questions. Um, okay, I guess uh, see you next time uh, at the seminar series. Bye, everyone.